Thank you.
Next Sunday is also the Pumpkin Festival. You hopefully um, are involved some way in that. We are, we've had a couple meetings over the past week or so, and we still need um, a few people to work at the games. You don't have to do anything there. They're very simple. I'll hand out some prizes to the little kids. We're doing an hour and a half shifts. So if you can do that, um, you need to let, you can sign up in the back, or just let Janice or Wilden know that. Um, we still need a few more cakes for the cake walk. And how are we doing on tents? We need a couple. We still could use a couple, not sleeping tents, but you know, canopy type deals. Um, if you have one or two of those that you'd be willing to donate, that would be wonderful. So that festival will take place from noon to three next week. Um, John and Carol, I believe, are selling tickets. Um, we're particularly interested in you can advance purchase your, your lunch. So if you look at Chung, raise your hand. If you don't know Chung, Chung will be selling tickets for that. Um, it's going to be a great day. Weather's supposed to be 65, 0% chance of rain. So sun, so it's going to be a great day. Um, yes. Set up is, I believe, at 8.30. 8.30 next Sunday morning. Okay. Great. Lastly, um, I know you're thinking pumpkins, but next weekend, get this, is World Pasta Day. Yeah. And to an Italian, that is really important. <laughs> um, but I received notice this week from UCM, and UCM is acknowledging them, and they are going to be collecting, obviously, boxes of pasta. So while you're thinking pumpkins, pea pumpkins, also big pasta, and if you can remember, next Sunday, bring a box of pasta, leave it in the narthex, and all of that, those boxes will then be donated to UCM so we can um, work with them to provide food for any of you. Any other announcements? Yes. You plan to meet after the congregational meeting. Well, this truly is a day that the Lord has made. Let us all rejoice and be glad. Come, let us worship God. Thank
us pray. Thank you, God, for Mondays, for sadness, for cold, rainy nights, for the neighbor we don't talk to, for the aches and pains of getting older, for days when kids won't listen, for days when we don't want to get out of bed. Thank you, God, for when the roof leaks, for standing outside and waiting for the bus in the cold, for when the car needs the most expensive part, and for sleepless nights. Without these times, we wouldn't know the beauty of a good night's sleep, a cheap fix, a warm jacket while we wait, a roof over our head, the joy of children peacefully playing, for my shoulder feeling better, for the neighbors we visit with, for a bright fall day, for happiness, and for Sundays. Thanks God for our church. We've been enriched as a family by simply meeting and talking with the people here gathered today. Thanks for children's sermons. Thanks for the choir. And like Grace says, thanks for God and Jesus and everything. May we appreciate all the world has to offer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, today's scripture reading is very short, Bob. <laughs> Esther chapter 2, all the way 1 through 18. After these things, when the anger, when the anger of King Ashurus had abated, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what had been decreed against her. Then the king's servants who attended him said, Let beautiful young virgins be sought out for the king, and let the king appoint commissioners in all the provinces of his kingdom to gather all the beautiful young virgins to the harem in the citadel of Susa under custody of Haggai, the king's eunuch, who is in charge of the women. Let their cosmetic treatments be given to them, and let the girl who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. This pleased the king, and he did so. Now there was a Jew in the citadel of Susa whose name was Mordecai, son of Jair, son of Shimei, son of Kish, a Benjaminite. Kish had been carried away from Jerusalem among the captives carried away when King Jeconiah of Judah and King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon had carried away. Mordecai had brought up Hadassah, that is Esther, his cousin, for she had neither father nor mother. The girl was fair and beautiful, and when her father and her mother died, Mordecai adopted her as his own daughter. So when the king's order and his edict were proclaimed, and when many young women were gathered in the citadel of Susa in the custody of Haggai, Esther was also was taken into the king's palace and put in custody of Haggai, who had charge of the women. The girl pleased him and won his favor, and he quickly provided her with cosmetic treatments and her portion of food, and with seven chosen maids from the king's palace, and advanced her and her maids to the best place in the harem. Esther did not reveal her people or kindred, for Mordecai had charged her not to tell. Every day, Mordecai would walk around in front of the court of the harem to learn how Esther was and how she fared. The turn came for each girl to go in to King Asuras after being 12 months under the regulations for the women. Since this was a regular period of their cosmetic treatment, six months with oil and myrrh and six months with perfumes and cosmetics for women. When the girl went in to the king, she was given whatever she asked for to take with her from the harem to the king's palace. In the evening, she went in. Then in the morning, she came back to the second harem in custody of Shazgaz, the king's eunuch, who was in charge of all the concubines. She did not go in to the king again unless the king delighted in her and she was summoned by name. When the turn came for Esther, daughter of Abihail, the uncle of Mordecai, who had adopted her as his own daughter, to go in to the king, she asked for nothing except what Haggai, the king's eunuch, who had now charge of the women, advised. Now Esther was admired by all who saw her. When Esther was taken to King Asuras in his royal palace in the tenth month, which is the month of Tebeth, in the seventh year of his reign, the king loved Esther more than all the other women. Of all the virgins, she won his favor and devotion, so that he set her royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. 
Then the king gave a great banquet to all his officials and ministers. Esther's banquet. He also granted a holiday to the provinces and gave gifts with royal liberality. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you. 
something wonderful for us to talk about and take a look at this morning? Okay, everybody have a seat. Let's see what we have here. You brought in a piggy bank. And tell me, how many of you guys have a bank? A piggy bank or something that you, what do you do with a bank? Put money. You put money in. This one's empty. How come there's nothing in it? You just decorated it, okay. So you're gonna put pennies and nickels and maybe some dimes and quarters in there. And what are you going to do with all of the money that you save up? Buy. You're gonna to go to the bank and then put it into your account. Wonderful. Do you save money that you gave it? What did you say you were? Do you have a bank? Yes. Do you put money in it? Yes. And what do you do with the money when the bank is full? You want to <laughs> She kind of wants to shop. <laughs> okay. How many, how many other, uh, uh, how many of you also like to shop? When you save your money, then you take it and you go out and well, buy something, right? Do you like to do that, Jocelyn? Yeah. yeah. You what? Yeah. You, oh, you do like to do that a little bit. Okay. Do you like to do that too? What kinds of things are you going to buy? If you could save up, let's say, like $10. I don't know. You could probably get $10. What would you go buy with your ten dollars? A Lego set. A Lego set. Okay. A video game. A, something for your American girl. What would you buy? A giant racetrack. A giant racetrack. Uh, two dolls. Okay. What would you buy? Cars. Okay, if you buy had more than that, you buy a dog. An iPhone 6 Plus, okay. <laughs> so, why is it that when we think about saving money, we only think about spending it on things that we want? Things that we want. Like, do you ever think maybe some of that money that I saved, maybe I should give it away? Yes, have you heard somebody tell you that before? No. No? Well, well mom has your mom has said it's kind of important for us to think about all that we have and, and not just keeping it for ourselves, but sometimes giving it away to others. Like in a couple weeks, um, Miss Hazel and probably some of the other people, women from Presbyterian women, are going to start talking about shoe boxes. Do you remember the past couple years we pack up shoe boxes and we fill them with gifts and we send them overseas? How about I talked about world today? Maybe this week you want to take just four of the quarters that's in your bank and give it to your mom or your dad and say, when you go to the store, buy an extra pound of pasta so that I can put it in the market next Sunday at church. Not everything that we have, not all the money that we're given should be used on us. Sometimes we need to think about doing something with that money that might help somebody else. Okay? Yeah, what did you want to say, Jonathan? Remember when you were talking to me about Grandpa, you gave me a hundred Because, why did you decide not? It's not enough? Well, maybe you don't need to give a third of that to an animal shelter. Maybe you could just give a couple, maybe like five, a few dollars. God appreciates, real quickly, there's a story in the Bible called The Widow's Might. And it's about a lady who is searching for just one little coin that she wants to give to God. That's God appreciates that. You don't need to give $100. You don't even need to give $33. Just something. We should be all giving something to help somebody else. So think about that. And when next time you, you crack open your bank or take out the little stopper at the bottom, think about using some of that money for somebody else. Okay? Yes. Sacrificial giving. Yes, God does appreciate that. 
Oh my goodness, you guys all have so much to say to you. It'll reset. And he counts it for you. Good, Kalea. That's a great idea. We might want to think about doing that. Having two banks, you could decorate a whole other pig. Okay? And one could be for others, and one could be for you. That would be a great one. All right. Talk about that a little bit out of way on today, and let's pray, and then you guys can go back to your seats, okay? Dear God, thank you for constantly giving to us. Help us to learn to give to others. Okay, who wants to take a bag next week? Who has not had it yet? There you go. You can fill it up and bring it back next week. Thank you, guys. Let us pray. Gracious God, that is our prayer this morning. With all of our hearts, with all of our minds, God, may we truly know you more. For the sake of Jesus, in whose name we pray, amen. Okay, please be seated. There really are all kinds of ways by which we might get to know God more. But approaching his word, studying it, reading it, reflecting on it, that is is no doubt the primary way we get to know God better. God is revealed to us in greater and more life-changing ways when we do that. 
And so we can't help but, but grow closer and closer to, to him. And I hope that that's what happens when we engage in a study like this, a study of the book of Esther. Now, as I've said before, studying scripture is not an easy task. And we touched on that a good bit in our Wednesday Bible study this past week. That bumper sticker, I don't think I've seen it on the car in our parking lot, but you know the one that says, the Bible says it, I believe it, that settles it? Um, I'm just not sure it's that easy. I'm just not sure that a random reading of the Bible, looking at what it says, and then saying, okay, I believe that, without any kind of ruminating, I'm not sure that that really takes us deeper in our walks with God. It took me a while, but about five years ago, I began ending my scripture readings in worship settings like this with more than just the word of the Lord. Hopefully you've noticed it over the past year and a half. I added the word of the Lord and what do I normally say? The poetry of the faithful. That's what you've been hearing me say since I arrived here as a way of reminding us that in spite of Scripture's authority in the lives of Christ followers, and even though we believe the words in the Bible to be divinely inspired, Scripture is also a very human document. It was written by human beings, and so it brings the same flaws that human beings bring to everything that we do. After all the study of Scripture that I've done over the years, it finally became painfully clear to me that some parts of the Bible are really not much more than a person's or a community's opinion about what they thought God was doing in the world around them. And sometimes they were accurate, and sometimes they were anything but. And if you spend any amount of time really studying the Bible, particularly many of the passages in the Old Testament, you will see how true that statement really is. In fact, there are some passages that make you wonder if God had anything to do with them at all. And so responding solely with the words, this is the word of the Lord. Well, for me, that suddenly became very problematic. And in a small way, that is the case this morning. Last week, in the study of Esther, I introduced you to Queen Vashti. This week, we're going to spend some time looking at Esther. And some of the things that Chad read this morning make me question, is this really the word of the Lord? But let me set the scene for those of you who maybe weren't here last week or haven't been following along at home. The banquet, King Xerxes' banquet. And again, I said this last week, there are two different names for the king. Xerxes is far much easier to pronounce. Um, Xerxes has this big banquet last week, somewhere in the third year of his reign, around 483, it's believed, B.C. And at the conclusion of the banquet, who's missing? The queen. Xerxes looks, looks around, probably in a very drunken state, and he notices that the queen is absent. And when he calls her, she decides she's not going to come. She doesn't want to be paraded around in front of a bunch of drunken men. And as a result, her punishment is she is put out of the palace. Because of her disobedience, she's thrown out of the palace. Today, what we see happening in chapter 2 is the king and his servants begin the search for a new queen. We're told that after Xerxes' anger had cooled, that's what the text says, when his anger had been abated, we, decide, we see that he's ready to find someone else to take Vashti's place. But it's worth noting that we're not just talking a week or a month or even a year here. Several years have gone by. In verse 16, 
we see that we are now in the seventh year of the king's reign. So it could have been as many as four years had passed. History tells us that in that period of time, Xerxes had unsuccessfully tried to conquer Greece. He had a mighty empire. The Persian Empire was huge. 127 provinces, I think we read in the first chapter of Esther. He's not content with that. He tries to take Greece, but in a very fierce battle, history books tell us that Xerxes failed. So by now, Xerxes is a pretty beaten down man. His queen is no longer in the palace with him. He's not finding much success militarily. He was no doubt depressed, deflated, and lonely. It had been a long four years. Is it any wonder that he starts looking for someone who can bring some, what, warmth back into his life? That's probably what made his servants begin this search. The search for a new queen. They were tired of the king moping around the palace. He needs a harem, they decide. Women. Many women. And so the search begins. And this is where I get really uncomfortable. Because the events that take place in this second chapter of Esther... I have difficulty thinking God would endorse much of it. But somehow they're used. Somehow the events of Esther, all of them, are used by God for God's glory. We're giving many details about the banquet that the king threw in chapter 1. And now in chapter 2, we're giving almost as many about the beauty practices of the women. All kinds of treatments, perfumes. The women were given oil of myrrh, the text says, for six months. That was probably something like oil of Olay in the day. And all of this is being done in an attempt to make sure that the king saw only the most beautiful women in the kingdom. Beautiful, that is, on the outside. The manicures and the pedicures, the eyeliner and the mascara, the blush and the lipstick. It gives an exterior beauty that Xerxes valued. A beauty, unfortunately, that too many in our world still value too much today. Josephus, a Jewish historian, also writes about these events and says that there were probably as many as four hundred women involved in this scene. Many of them spent months pampering their bodies with costumes and cosmetics. Elegant charm and erotic seduction were needed to win the day, Josephus says. And so they pulled out all the stops. Women put on their best face and more. Everyone knew what was expected. They knew that the king would spend a night with each of the women, and then after that was done, and I can only imagine how long that takes with 400 women. We're talking over a year here. Then, after that process was completed, he would make his choice for the next queen. It really was the biblical version of The Bachelor. The word of the Lord? Really? This is where enter Esther comes into the scene. Now Esther, which I think we learned from the text, Esther was an orphan. She was raised by her cousin Mordecai. Her father and mother had died when she was very young, and so her uncle's son took her in and raised her as his own. And over the years, the text says Esther grew to be a very beautiful woman without all of the primping of the kingdom. Esther was Jewish, and the prospect of a Jew becoming the queen of Persia, it was as slim as one could imagine. 
Remember, the events of this book are taking place during Babylonian captivity, when the nations of Israel and Judah were in the hands of stronger, more powerful nations. And so conquered people, and that's what the Jews were, conquered people, they were not only the enemy, but they were viewed as less than the natives. So as a Jew in captivity, Esther was raised She was raised to know very little about ointments and perfumes. She wasn't trying to impress anyone, let alone with just her looks. But in spite of that, in spite of all of that, somehow, some way, her beauty attracted attention. And as a result, she was noticed by the servants of the king, and she winds up being considered as a possible member of this harem. The Hebrew word that's used in verse 8 of chapter 2, which is translated in the passage we read this morning as taken. She was taken. But that same Hebrew word in countless other Old Testament passages is translated a little differently. It's translated captured. And that probably is the word that should have been used here. Some women may have wanted to be part of this harem, but Esther most certainly did not. She didn't want to say goodbye to the only family that she had left. She didn't desire to be part of any harem for some heathen king And she was certainly not interested in intermarriage outside of her religion. She didn't want any of that. And so there's a pretty good chance that Esther was not just taken, she was captured against her will, taken by force. And that's where the remarkable story begins. Oster and Pather Chuck Swindoll summarizes the next series of events after this captivity by simply saying this, Esther wins the pageant. Scripture says that she was admired by everyone who saw her. And as a result, she's given the final rose by the bachelor king. Xerxes loved her more than any of the other young women. And so the crown is placed upon her head and this unlikely Jewish girl becomes the new queen of Persia. In verse 9, the text says that she pleased him. Again, that's not the best translation A better translation from the Hebrew would be this. She lifted up grace before him. You see, the first thing that is so remarkable about this story is that in spite of all of these events, Esther still appears to have grace for this this king, her, her new husband. Think about that. For me, I grew up being told um, that, how would you define grace? Let me ask you that. How might you define grace? What is grace? Anybody want to tackle that? Unmerited favor. God's giving us what we do not deserve. That's what I grew up believing grace was. And that is what Esther displays here. She gives the king what he really doesn't deserve. Giving Xerxes the benefit of the doubt, which which was probably really hard to do, Esther apparently sees something decent in the man, and she shows him grace. Perhaps she knew the saying, there's so much good in the worst of us, and so much bad in the best of us, that it hardly behooves any of us to criticize the rest of us. Have you heard that saying before? Let me, let me share it one more time. There's so much good in the worst of us and so much bad in the best of us that it hardly behooves any of us 
to criticize the rest of us. As hard as it must have been for Esther, she saw something in the king worthy of grace. And that's what she shows him. She allows herself to become the queen. And she extends a grace to the king that perhaps many of us cannot even begin to comprehend. Even though she didn't want to be part of this demeaning charade. And in spite of the fact that she didn't feel very grace-filled. She knew that God could somehow use the situation. And she was not going to allow anything to keep her from being his vessel. Like Christian Rieger and Dietrich Bonhoeffer. In the Nazi concentration camps that I spoke about last week. Esther knew that God had not forgotten her. And that knowledge enabled her to trust and to be faithful. And as a result, she gave Xerxes a glimpse into God's grace for all of us. That's the first thing I think we can learn from Esther. The second thing has something to do with self-control. We're told in verse 10 and in verse 20 that Esther didn't let anyone know that she was Jewish. And if she had done that, if she had just done that, she probably would have been sent back to Mordecai. They probably were not at all interested in having a Jewish woman as the queen of Persia. But she didn't. Again, she knew that God had a plan. Something was ahead for her that she did not understand. The ways of God are not like the ways of human beings. She knew that. She understood that. And so she she exercised self-control and she kept her mouth shut. She listened to the advice of her uncle Mordecai, her cousin Mordecai, and she did not tell the king that she was Jewish. Part of her inner beauty, I think, comes from the air of mystery that that kind of surrounded her. She said what needed to be said and nothing more and nothing less. And again, she trusted God through it. Finally, and somewhat related to this whole issue of of self-control, because Esther listened to her cousin I think we see that she had a very teachable spirit. She had a teachable spirit about her. She didn't flaunt her independence. We see that even after she was crowned the queen. In verse 22, she continues to listen to Mordecai. She found dignity in having a teachable spirit. She knew that she didn't have all the answers That there were others who were wiser than she was. And so she was willing to listen to them. She was willing to learn from them. There was a humility about Esther that is admirable. She didn't have a chip on her shoulder. There wasn't any kind of arrogance or haughtiness in her heart. And so just before she goes to be with the king in verse 15, unlike all of the other women, Esther asks for nothing. She takes what she's given and she's content with that. Here was a woman of no more than 20 years of age who could have gotten anything she wanted. But she remains true to herself and true to God. She knew who she was and whose she was. One of the commentaries that I read said that Esther knew what she believed. And she knew God's hand was on her life. And knowing that, knowing that allowed her to be teachable. It allowed her to be humble. And it allowed her to trust. The more I read about this woman, the more I'm reminded of Proverbs 31. Do you, are you familiar with that proverb? I, I've read it at so many funerals. 
Um, and I have to confess, sometimes it seems to have fit more than others. It's a great passage. Let me, because you're not familiar with it, let me read it for you this morning. Proverbs 31. A capable wife, who can find? She is far more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. She seeks wool and flax. She works with willing hands. She's like the ships of the merchant and brings food from far away. She rises while it is still night and provides food for her husband and for her maidservant. She considers a field and she buys it. With the fruit of her hands, she plants a vineyard. She girds herself with strength and makes her arms strong. She perceives that her merchandise is profitable. Her lamp does not go out. She opens her hands to the poor, and she reaches out to the needy. She's not afraid for her household when it snows, for all her household is clothed in crimson. She makes herself coverings. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Strength and dignity she wears, and she laughs at the time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her happy, her husband too. Charm is deceitful. Beauty is vain. But a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Maybe a little sexist, but words written hundreds of years ago speak powerfully about what it truly means to be a faithful woman of God. And we see that powerfully in the life of this young Jewish queen named Esther. A woman who fears the Lord. She's to be praised. Her beauty, her inner beauty, lasts. It's not superficial it's not just something that can be drawn around her eyes or colored on her cheeks or painted on her lips. Esther's beautiful because of what was inside of her. Paul says in, in 1 Corinthians that our outer buildings are wasting away. He's trying to be kind. What he's basically saying is we're getting old and our bodies are showing it. But there's something that doesn't die and all of us, something deeper, something inside. And it's a beauty that Esther displays for us. We're going to look at her in more detail next week, but for now, just to know, just know, just remember, she was a woman of great strength and dignity. And see that. Begin to see that in everything that happens to her. God's ways are different from our ways. But he's always working. He takes King Xerxes' drunkenness, Queen Vashti's sensibility, Esther's strength and dignity, and he uses them for his glory. Whatever is going on in your life today, Whatever it is that you are being forced to deal with, the good and the bad, what makes sense and what doesn't make sense, the tears and the pain as well as the joys and the celebrations, no matter what is going on, know that somehow, some way, God is at work. God is doing something. 
You may not see his name, but as in the book of Esther, God is powerfully at work. So show some grace. Exercise some self-control. Be patient. Be gentle. Learn and listen to the people around you. Be like Esther. A man or a woman, a boy or a girl, with strength and with dignity. And to God be all the glory. Amen. Let's pray. God, as we bring before you now our monetary gifts, we, uh, we consider all the other things that make us who we are. Help us consider how they too might be offered yet again for the sake of Christ. Amen. Would the ushers please come forward to receive our offering?
session records were reviewed without exception. So Hazel is very thankful this morning. And we thank you for all that you do there. Yes.
Now, friends, to Him who by His Spirit's work in each one of us is able to do abundantly more than anything we hope, dream, or even dare to imagine, to Him be all glory and honor in our lives and in this church, now and forever. And all God's people agreed and said, Amen. Amen.